Right. Uh, thank Please. you so much, uh, Jan and Kim, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to speak to the optimal control community. And I'll be talking about a few things we did in the last couple of years and released them as a part of the image library. Uh, and uh, one of the side effects is demonstrating that if you do mathematics in a serious way in this area, then a beard is a non-negotiable requirement. Uh, okay, so uh, why are we, uh, well, first thing, what are we looking at? Uh, and that is chief spin. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that uh, my little lockdown project has been a success. There's now a 400-page book titled Simply Spin. And uh, what I will be talking about today, um, about half of it is already in Chapter 8 and Chapter 9, so Optimal Control of Spin Systems which uh, explores the grape algorithm in great detail and the notes on software engine uh, and there's a chapter two there titled what exactly is spin now out of curiosity if you understand to your own satisfaction exactly what spin is hands up uh okay a few people who say they got it from the book uh, um, all right. So uh, by way of introduction, of course, we are all to some extent group theorists here. And this is our lovely SO3 rotation group. And it has this commutation relation between the rotation J. And of course, what is conserved uh, is the Casimir invariant in the envelope of the corresponding Lie algebra, uh, roughly speaking, the sum of squares of all the generators in there. And this is our orbital. But of course, we don't live in R3, uh, we live in Minkowski space time. Uh, and so the group is actually SO31, Euclidean, and one pseudo Euclidean part. And there you also have Lorentz boosts. And the boost is if you accelerate something, it shrinks in the direction of travel and it's local timing. So uh, a stretch and squeeze rather than rotation. But the interesting thing about boost generate is they commute into a rotation gene. So whereas here you could not rotate the point because the moment of inertia is infinite, here you can take a point object, boost it in one direction, boost it in perpendicular, oops, you have rotated a point object. So there are more ways of rotating things in special relativity than there had been 3D because of this commutation relation. And then, of course, the Casimir invariant now has six generators, and so we have a correction to the conservation law for the corresponding invariant. You now have the orbital angular momentum, and you have this little correction, and the little. And this is only for the elementary particles. Of course, the composite particles like nuclei, nuclear spin isn't really spin, it's just the total angular the ground space, it has orbital orbit coupling inside the nucleus. So what you see and the associated this moment is the result of complete of every moment. And then of course because of that magnetic moment we have our lovely area of spin dynamics with magnetic resonance imaging, magnetic chemistry, magnetobiology, and the mass that I will be talking about and resonance. A reminder what an MR facility looks like it's a giant uh, magnet, uh, you know, a few tons of metal with liquid nitrogen in the outer cryostat, liquid helium in the inner cryostat. And this central area is about two centimeters up uh, along and half a centimeter across. And the magnetic field is stabilized uh, to 10 to the minus nine in space and 10 to the minus nine time on the time scale of three. And we normally have uh, around three coils here at different frequencies, tuned to different frequencies. So between two and six radio frequency control channels, we always have dissipative dynamics and we always ensemble ensemble. It's the same with an MRI scanner. It's just a probe is an awful lot bigger and there is carefully controlled magnetic field and homogeneity to be able to tell what is where. But also very importantly for today's lecture, this is how a coil looks like for brain imaging. It has multiple spatially independent 
but of course electromagnetically linearly depend, uh, independent non-orthogonal transmitters. And so typically there you'd have, uh, you know, over 20 control channels, three magnetic field gradient direction, and uh, if you count these coils, at least six frequency control channels, which vary in space as well as in operation. And of course, uh, quantum marketing did not exist in 1977, so we simply call it magnetic resonance imaging, not nuclear relativistic entangled quantum microscopy or something that it would have been called these days. Uh, right? And of course, in magnetic resonance, uh, the business of optimal control has started quite early. Um, in the years that I was born, uh, Malcolm Levitt uh, has published uh, the first observation of magnetic resonance that, of course, if you just use square pulses, they are unstable with respect to power variations, tuning, uh, and some other things. But if you stack those pulses, like 90 in X, 240 in Y, and then 90 in X again, then you have much more precise block sphere inversion than you would have had square pulses. And likewise for all the other uh, of spins. And Malcolm called it composite pulses. And then uh, dynamical decoupling appeared shortly uh, thereafter from the same people. And in magnetic resonance, uh, we are quite spoiled by our time uh, scales. So our rotating frame Hamiltonians are usually less constant. So we've got this order product. Uh, then the shaped pulses turned up in magnetic resonance around 1990s. Of course, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian function is another Gaussian, so in linear response theory, it's actually quite easy. Pulses. That's a selective inversion uh, of a signal in a 30-spin system uh, that has couplings in it. So large spin system simulations have long been sold in magnetic resonance, which frequently hundreds and thousands of couplings, including in the present patient, even software uh, is there that, that does that. Um, and then you can cascade those Gaussians and have band selective pulses, uh, but you can see uh, the topic of today's lecture is starting to emerge. Uh, all of those pulses were either piecewise constant explicitly, or they were digitized constant. Uh, and uh, uh, th thanks to Tommaso for the lovely introduction into why that is a bad thing. Right, so we need to start moving away. Uh, okay, and here we come to grade where piecewise constant is a part of the design process. Right, the very first approximation that the grade paper makes at the very beginning of it is that we assume that our Hamiltonian is piecewise constant and we, we vary slightly. And in 2005, uh, the algorithm that um, Great proposed for the calculation of fidelities, but more importantly, the gradient of was absolutely revolutionary. Now, let me explain why that is the case. So, we always work in a joint representation, so otherwise known as Lusal space, because all of our dynamic is our control um, localized. So, you have the initial condition, and these are your, your major exponentials, so propagators. Uh, and then you have the target state and you have some penalties if necessary. And we want to maximize this. And of course, every slice propagator is the exponential of our drift plus our control operator with control coefficient. Now, the revolutionary innovation in gray, uh, that, uh, so the portraits of Navin and Stefan are here. And Thomas's portrait, you can see if you look around somewhere, there, there he is. So uh, these, these, these gentlemen produced an utter revolution because they found an algorithm that calculates the gradient of this. You see, if you're really careful with the housekeeping of all the matrices in there, asymptotically at the same cost as fidelity. Uh, and for a gradient, this is really impressive, right? And of course, no amount of D would mechanically find the same level of efficiency. So uh, this was spectacular, and this is what took it off the ground in nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, and then, of course, these derivatives uh, of the matrix exponentials, you can compute them by a Taylor series, you can compute them by finite differences, but now I will show you my favorite equation. Uh, 
Uh, and this is something that goes back to the 70s, uh, but to us, uh, Sophie Shermer just mentioned it in passing at, at one of the conferences. And this is nearly as cool as Sophie is looking in this photograph. If you have a matrix A that depends on the parameter alpha in any differential way, and you just put that block here, that block here, that derivative, control operator for us, really, here. You exponentiate this block matrix in the corner. You magically have the derivative of this. You don't even need the linearity here. A can depend on alpha in any nonlinear way so long as uh, that. Uh, this is the coolest matrix in nowhere. And this is how all are calculated in all of the open. So, um, and in my lab. Uh, okay, so now we come to practicalities. Of course, uh, over the last 20 years, this community, ourselves included, has developed all of that, implemented all of that in the software, released the software. Now we need to put it to good use. And at that point, you know that the gremlins come out of the clocks. And uh, this is our probe. And you can see there's the inductors there and the capacitors in there and there's a coil here. It's an RLC circuit, fairly complicated, uh, not as simple as this by a mile. And it has a response function. And of course, you've all done second graduate engineering. You do the Fourier transform or Laplace transform of the differential equation. Uh, that, that's your, your response multiplier. And these are your Q factors. And so if we send a particular pulse sequence into the instrument, this is it. You, you, you see these blocks because there's a super rapid oscillation. There's a 600 megahertz oscillation, which are simply just not visible on the time scale of the microsecond. Uh, but if you heterodyne away the carrier frequency, that, that's your typical piecewise constant power. Uh, and if you send it through this, or mathematically just apply this, response function, of course, you've got this rising and falling transit. And typically, Q factors between 50 and 200 are very common in magnetic resonance, so these transients are unavoidable. And um, ultimately, it's just a linear transformation, but with a badly conditioned. And you can see my problem, and this is what Tommaso illustrated so brilliantly, that much as we might wish to pre that our control sequence is piecewise constant, really, at the point when the magnetic field flies out of the coil and hits the sample, it is not. So we need to propagate the system through every blasted transit that is there, and we'd better have a way of doing that. And this digitization drama, I call it, it continues. So that's the same 30-spin system uh, with... Uh, the J couplings in between them. If we want to invert a band, uh, so in this case, a two kilohertz band, we need a chirp pulse, uh, as one does. And of course, if you zoom in the high frequency edges of the chirp, you need many thousands. But of course, if we simply just switch the representation, we look at the representation, uh, which is not amplitude time, uh, but amplitude time for the envelope and frequency of it. Then the envelope's nice and small. This was linear would be a fair approximation here. And because it's a linear frequency chirp, this is just literally a straight line and frequency. So in some representations, these things are much than others. Um, and uh, this is variously called Placasio and focal function, depending on who you ask. But you could digitize it much better. Okay, and then how do we solve the dynamics with smoothly varying Hamiltonian? Well, there's another beard for you, and I need to remind you how we integrate. Well, we just took the area here, the area there, the area there, and we summed up all of those areas. And this is called the Riemann form, the limit of the sum of these areas in the infinitesimally thin slice case. Uh, what about our Schrodinger's? Well, uh, the more general case, when the generator can depend on the state, for example, Gross-Hayes, the property, 
the state is called the leaf. And then we are not adding up the slices, we are multiplying. And this is called the product mathematics. So you have state, you have your generator, and the state at t. t is this exponential applied state t. And so we are multiplying this exponential. So the note is right here, we're summing up the slices. Here we are multiplying up the slices. This is called the product quadrature. And then this product quadrature is okay. You've got a bunch of exponentials. That's your time ordered product. Takes the limit and it converges to time ordered exponential. And I hate Dyson operators as well. I hate Dyson for that matter. The input is horrible. This back arrow is much better because it reminds you of the time of the original product, the time ordered exponentials, at least in that book. I denoted by a back arrow. So piecewise constant approximation, of course, on this scale is the worst possible approximation because it corresponds to the rectangles rule of the integration. And of course, we have easier, we have Simpson, we have all sorts of other things. Uh, and so recent methods, they all came out after 2010 or thereabouts, are about exploring better ways product quadrant, and we have extended that to optimal control. Okay, so we have our limit of our product and this equation of motion. Uh, and how would we build a higher order? Well, all of us understand Lie groups in here. Of course, the exponential action is unavoidable because this is what connects the algebra to the group. This is what keeps the semigroup the geometric properties of our integrators. So uh, these fine gentlemen uh, have noted that you can reformulate this problem by not having the equation of motion for your state vector, but for having the equation of motion for your generator inside the Lie algebra. And then so long as you keep this exponential exact, you can approximate at the level of the algebra. And these are Bernoulli's coefficients, and these are nested commutators. This series can be truncated. Uh, this equation of motion on the algebra in the approximate or whatever. And so long as you keep this exponential exact, you retain all the properties. So you can have a second order Lie integrator which costs you one extra commutator in the algebra uh, of the second order. You can have a fourth order in which the midpoint uh, all of these things were initially proposed by Hans Monte Kass, and they're called Runde Kutta Monte Kass. Uh, but Iserles, Kassas, and Blaine seem to actually a lot more efficient ones. Uh, and uh, let me show you what I mean by efficient. So Anu Acharya and Luke Rasulov in my group have implemented that into spinach. It is now released. So if you have an interval, you have a left Hamiltonian, right Hamiltonian, and midpoint Hamiltonian. That's the, the commutator to do. And this is the accuracy as a function of the number of points in the equation for this shape pulse. You can see fourth order quadrature at 50 points is more accurate than our usual piecewise constant method, you know, at about 2,000. This is ridiculously more precise and it scales much more. I mean, one lousy commutator we can probably afford if the accuracy by so much for things where the generator depends on time in a non way. So I invite you to read this recent review uh, by Ari and uh, into all of this. Okay, how do we port this to optimal control? And this is where we come in. So Luke has bravely said, well, okay, let's start with the piecewise linear. Uh, and I encourage you to also read the recent paper by Dal Gard and Matsoy, uh, who had a somewhat different implementation of broadly the same idea. Uh, their digitization point, the middle, um, their Magnus point, um, uh, and our digitization point are on the sides because we want to reuse the propagator and we want to share it. Okay, so you have the propagator from point one to point two, roughly speaking, and that's your H and H. Two and H1 and H2 here. You have the propagator through this slice, and you also have this. So now, unlike constant case, you are sharing 
the edge propagator right and we need to differentiate if we want right on that but of course product rule does not require the only uh, property it requires is associativity and so we can simply just differentiate with respect to some control coefficients in here we can just use the product rule uh, and reduce it back to the derivative of individual matrix exponential and indeed once you know the dust settles and you measure the instrument response this is some optimal sequence for quadrupolar NMR spectroscopy uh, and you can see that it's a lot less distorted by the instrument the y-axis is there but that's the same waveform so the distortions are a lot more than the distortions uh, we have uh, okay, but uh, it's not just this that we need to do. Of course, we are in the joint representation. These matrices are giant. We need to avoid creating them. So we need direct calculation. So come director. Uh, and uh, that's done by Krilov methods, of course. So we can compute uh, the exponential action on a vector without exponential. Uh, we just compute the Krilov subspace, we are sub-analyze this, we project into there, calculate the action inside this small subspace, and then project back. Uh, and uh, that, that's this chap's idea, and um, uh, he's a remarkable person, and another beard. He was the general in the Russian Imperial Navy, just before the revolution. And just after the communist, he was the same general in the Russian Red. Now, how he had accomplished the forbidden transition without getting shot in the process, only he knows. Uh, but he was a capable mathematician, and in 1931, he had published this, and that was the first paper in mathematics, and I think he can be credited with being the first to actually count the cost. He counted how many multiplications does every in 1931. Right, so he is to be so General Alexei Krylov. Uh, that's the Russian pronunciation of that. Is to be credited with a lot of modern expense calculations in computing. Uh, and so now, what we need is, of course, to reorder that. And um, uh, Krylov was too uh, sophisticated. Uh, of course, the only thing we need to know is with which coefficients do we mix these products to get the action. And we already know those. The Taylor sheet. Um, and so we can simply just do, you know, matrix times vector times matrix times matrix, matrix and this only does make a product. We combine them, and uh, Anu in my group was there to, to generalize the general uh, to the case of the Lee product quadrature. Again, you can reorder the products in here, so you don't even need to compute this commutator. The only thing you need, uh, to do is just sequential matrix vector products where the matrix. Uh, so, so this was implemented in uh, and is now released, published. Um, and so, of course, the second thing we need to do is we need to be able to control things like Bose-Einstein, uh, where in the gross pitayevsky equation, the generator is state-dependent. So our equation is not little von Neumann. It's a more general case of the dependent generator. And the same group of mathematicians have proposed, again, Lee, Lee group geometric integrator for the case of state-dependent generators. Uh, you need to do a bit more arithmetic in there, but ultimately the same thing. It goes to point Lee integrator. And in magnetic resonance, we do have such cases that hold radiation damping. This is where the sample interacts with its own magnetic field when it's magnetized very slowly. Um, so uh, Anu uh, did some simulations on that. This is the case of an inverted, very strong magnetization, where spontaneously um, radio frequency, okay, so the so-called maser effect. Uh, and all of these equations are, are, are in this paper, but more importantly, a human readable, well-documented code for all of this. Uh, and spinach on GitHub. Um, one thing that I would mention in passing, uh, I don't see it used much, but actually grape is also applicable to time slice duration, because mathematically the derivative with respect to delta t is no difference to the derivative coefficient, and so we've also implemented uh, time slice duration 
to great continuum unit when time slice is here for a, a, a pulse signal that moves on the protein fluorines. And then, of course, uh, to, to connect to Tomaso's talk, uh, in, in Crab, uh, he parameterizes the sequence um, by saying, okay, these are now coefficients in front of some basis. That's linear parameter. We can also have nonlinear parameters. Depends on some parameters. Uh, but of course, that's just a, a, a variable, right? So uh, the fidelity in any curvy linear parameterization is just a Jacobian multiplication away from any rectus uh, parameter. And so if you have a great gradient and you know the Jacobian of your parameterization, then just this coefficients and that's the crap for you. So spinach again, uh, all of them um, out of the box. Uh, Hessian, uh, of course, the same cool method. You make a block matrix, you exponentiate it, and magically the second derivative of your propagator turns up the top right corner. This was all implemented by, by 2016. In fact, David has just found, uh, David Goodwin, just found an algorithm which asymptotically computes the Hessian at the same cost as the gradient. That was a real revolution, and you can see that's how steepest descent converges. This is how LBFGS converges. And this is how Newton Rust you have the, the Hessian. Uh, you need to regularize it, but again, this is all now implemented and well tested. Um, and one other remark I would make if you are thinking about approximating your gradients, don't. Right? Any approximate gradient gets stuck very rapidly. Uh, as you iterate, you need a machine. Otherwise, uh, stuck. Um, so uh, the advantages of this is it's extremely parallel and GPU friendly uh, and useful in MRI. This is why we are using it, right? Uh, by when we are starting to do magnetic resonance imaging, we are fighting magnetic field and homogeneity inside the patient's head, and that means the patient is there in the magnet, right? And every patient is different. So I've got maybe. 200 seconds, that option, and I've got an infinite. I don't care how much it costs, so long as it costs the wall. And so this is why we are using Newton Rust's version of Crate. Uh, it is very useful in critical local time scenarios where you have infinite computing but finite time because it just converts. Right? Just Okay, so this is again all uh, spinach. Uh, a few recent things we put in, of course, any realistic optimally controlled system would have some prefixed events and some suffix events or, or some dead time. So uh, we support that out of the box where this is optimally great. So you just say, okay, prefix is some function. Uh, of course, it's there. You may need to go through specific subspaces. You may need to sign for at this point in time. I want you to be here at that point in time. I want you there. Simply just inserting a projector uh, into the subspace or state of interest accomplishes that. If it's not hitting it, it encounters, encounters a penalty. If it is hitting perfectly, the penalty. So in effect, you don't need to. Great. Uh, you just put the projector in both states or subspaces, scatters it, propagators, not even the derivative. Uh, and so we call them keyholes, and you can just declare an array of keyholes in your option. That's an example of a spin system that's being told to be in precisely two spin order, two spin correlation. At some point in time, you can see everything else has briefly dropped into zero. It has squeezed through those two holes and going. And finally, uh, what we've all been um, uh, doing it for practical implementations on helmets like this. Um, in MRI, uh, you would have in this helmet at least eight coils, each one with BX and BY in the rotating frame. And then three field slopes, uh, the pulse gradient, with strict power limits on them because you don't want to patient. And of course, they are non-uniform. They are 
wildly noisy. All right, so this is the profile of Bx of coil three, profile of Bx of coil four. You can just about make out the patient. This is the map to somebody's head. And this is the B0 in homogeneity. So this is the spatial variation of your drift. This is because the magnetic susceptibility of blood is different from the susceptibility of tissue, from the fatty tissue, and so on. So we still need uniform excitation, uniform slice selection in situations where the magnetic fields created by 16 control channels are wildly spatially in homogeneous. So this is modern uh, version 2.9 of Spinach, where you can have great optimizations on 18 independent patients. All right. So and that's the result. That's the slice selection. Of course, slice selection is the first stage of the MRI experiment, the readout and the imaging. So that's the slice itself, and that's the residual Z magnetization in that head. You can just about see that that slice in there. So this is all um, in, in Science Advances. And I would remind you that Christian is as a senior associate editor at Science Advances, and I am a section editor. So if you send some optimal control work in the general direction of Science Advances, uh, you are guaranteed the edit very well work. Whether that's a good thing, is that <laughs> for you? <laughs> but we'll understand exactly what you're doing. Um, OK. So final couple of slides, uh, another place where we have wildly non-uniform control channels and also chemical kinetics. So we need uh, to work in the joint representation, but also consider classical degrees of freedom, a microfluid, where you have spatial flow now, so hydrodynamic generation. Of course, that makes dynamics very different. And that's an example of, of the flow process of a certain spin state. So this is transverse magnetization flown through the sample. Uh, and the trouble here is a joint representation, chronic differential operators on this grid, and that's a massive plus three, means giant spark. And we've got enormous Hamiltonians, non-trivial spin states, couplings and big coherent sides and metabolites, right? So these are really big. And then you have to put dozens of control channels together. And, and here we come to, to what I would call the dirty secrets of spark. Because of course, we're all used to the fact that in Hamiltonians are really sparse. Uh, that's the S plus chrome S minus one non-zero. And you can actually put a rigorous uh, density bounds on spin operators in the book. Um, they are guaranteed to be sparse, the Zeeman base. Uh, but let us think about how a computer stores a sparse matrix. It's called compressed storage by rows format. It's the much more important. You have your sparse matrix, and you've got the row pointer uh, with zero base. So it starts at row number zero. The non-zeros are at element zero and element four, and those non-zeros are ten. And so the next non-zero turns up in position number zero, one, two of them. And that corresponds to, uh, to, to, to the position zero in that row and position one in that row, and those elements are three and nine. You can see the pointers here are compressed uh, like that by referring sequentially, and then these are your values. Now, this is brilliant for multiplicative operations because this thing just unzips itself neatly, gets itself multiplied, zips itself up. Great for memory utilization, of course, uh, because you're not storing zeros, but it is horrible, awful, if you need to add two of them. You need to unzip the entire object, merge the indices, and then recompress it. So the dirty secret of Spark is if you need to add up 2,000 of them, and I do because I've got proteins, right, uh, with, with 500 spins and 5,000 interactions between them, then God help. Uh, right? So it's actually probably not practical physically to add up 5,000 parts because of this. So additive operations, element insertion, column extraction, uh, any kind of memory access prediction to you, wave with goodbye. 
right? And so uh, when my Hamiltonian for protein in MR spectroscopy has 50,000 terms, I'm actually storing it in the coordinate format roughly speaking x, y, z. So row, column, value. And in that case, addition is just a merger of the indices and to use the standard MKL libraries at the very, very last stage after we've made the Hamiltonian, we compress it to CSR and then multiply it. Uh, so matrices are efficiently added in coordinate format and they multiply and compress over a column which way your language likely format. So spectrometer deployment in the last five minutes. Um, a little pyruvate, practical uh, metabolite used a lot in parahydrate and hyperpolarization, and let's make ourselves what we call a bulldozer pump. Let us sweep all of energy level differences here onto just one side. Yeah, so to sweep all the magnetization onto one side. Or we can start with the Zeeman magnetization, or we can populate along with two atoms, the so called. Or we can start with a single state. For example, this was an acetylene and parahydrogen arrived and parahydrogenated that. Then we will have a ton of the singlet order and we would like to move it to So we want to manipulate this. Remember, this dynamics is always dissipative. Uh, and this is why we like Thomas uh, because he has studied controllability, reachability, um, and all the, the, uh, the same. Do that. We have to be very precise about our drift. So this is fitting of experimental data. You can see we are spoiled in magnetic resonance by the quality of our model. We can fit everything through the pixel. Uh, Steam H2.9 automate uh, all of that. So we know our age quite well. Uh, then we have very broad ensemble. Our control amplitudes are distributed because the coil of the NMR probe has non-uniform one that's unavoidable. So we have a distribution in the control amplitude. We cannot be certain that the user has put the transmitter offset correctly. So we have distribution transmitter offset. We need to ensure phase invariance. So we have distribution of the phases. Uh, we need to make sure that certain coupling, which is confirmation dependent, doesn't influence the outcome. So we might have parameters in there. So giant broad uh, We want diagnostics on the order of spin correlation, the order of spin and polarization. And we want a spectrogram because it's nice and easy to interpret. So you can see that's um, a three um, triple nucleus experiment. These are protons, these are carbon, these are nitrogens, and then a spectrogram. And this was introduced by Stefan Glaser, uh, who who really made good use of. Uh, that you can see individual pulses at individual frequency locations. This is pretty much already a pulse, right? Very easy to interpret. Then we do have our controls, but very importantly, we have real-time diagnostics now in spinach. Uh, these are levels of spin correlation, uh, what for a single quantum system we would call an entanglement. Uh, these are populations on individual atoms of the protein backbone. This is a spaghetti plot because it's Ensemble, so every line is a member of the ensemble. And then finally, the magnetization arrives at its destination. Carbon C beta in some amino acid in a certain amount of time with a certain amount of accuracy in the presence of this system. Uh, uh, it's, it's a different system. I just use it as an example here, but this is uh, the allele pyruvate, the result of the bulldozer pulse. So we had three groups of spins. Uh, so that one. This one uh, and, and that one, the metal is shown somewhere. And uh, you can see that signal here uh, got bigger because we pushed some uh, population difference into it, and the rest of them got smaller because they have been. And uh, uh, this, this is something we've implemented experimentally, and it nicely works. And uh, I have to pay a compliment to Brooker, the NMR manufacturer. Uh, remember these, these coils? So uh, one is a proton coil, the other is a carbon coil, and carbon frequency is very far detuned, so we can use it as an antenna. Just plug the frequency uh, analyzer, uh, the network analyzer, directly into it. This is the control sequence we have on the wall clock. If we heterodyne away the carrier frequency, 
that's the in-phase component and that's the out-of-phase component. And here, red is what we wanted, our theoretically optimal pulse that we fed into the instrument. And blue is what the network analyzer had measured at the actual coil. I mean, this is a project, right? And we have to thank the mobile phone company for all of that. The radio frequency amplifiers, uh, radio frequency synthesizers, detection circuitry, everything has gone to this region. All right, so red is theoretical, blue is an actual sample point readout in an amount spectroscopy. And that's another example uh, of, of a different pulse. And you can see there are tiny variations. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, what, what uh, can be called the great instrumental betrayal, Brooker actually parameterizes because for 60 years and a month, we've been operating. I don't know. So we do have this wise linear amplifiers, but only actually, so we, we are so spoiled for that. There. And that's the experimental measurement. So this is the theoretically expected signal. And at exactly the right power and exactly the right offset around here somewhere, you see this of our spin system. So everything works. Uh, one uh, last thing to mention, uh, we also ported that to atom interferometers. Tim Frigard has found a lovely isomorphism uh, wherein the two states of interest in atom interferometer are basically the two. And as soon as it says which works, it where you're coming from. So that's your pi pulse as a hard pulse, uh, detuning amplitude error and uh, the interferometer. Contrast with our fidelity. If you use the standard bolt uh, sequence from ages ago in NMR, it gets a little bit better. If you use uh, hyperbolic tangent adiabatics, ever so bit better still. And if you use gradient ascent pulsing, these are this is one of the many pictures that Stefan Glaser would show you in NMR spectroscopy. Uh, really excellent contrast across the range in amplitude. So it's also Parameter. Okay, so summary. This is all public, uh, well documented code. This is the control um, structure of uh, the spinach library. You have multiple fidelity options. You have an unlimited number of control channels with four possible spatial operators. Uh, all of the correctly. Ensemble of initial conditions, ensemble of target states any prefix events, any suffix events, any amount of dead time, power level ensembles, offset ensembles with respect to any operator you want, not necessarily controls, but interactions. You can have variable time slice durations. You can have drift ensembles with respect to like an array of six Hamiltonian, amplitude ensembles, freeze masks, if you want to freeze this point in the control sequence, Phase cycles for NMI experiments. Uh, you can have grapes, uh, uh, um, crab style base sets. Um, so, and very good partitions of those. Keyholes to find post where you be at which time. Uh, a library of penalties, so run, running post and the corresponding weight. And various correlation coefficients because different elements of your ensemble have different parameters. Uh, so plus, you know, all sorts of tolerances, file system, checkpoints, crashes, started, um, and, and so on, lots of algorithmic options. All of that is MATLAB code, GPU capable, massively parallel, whatever runs MATLAB um, cluster will run that. So MATLAB uh, run GPI clusters, of course. And we have just posted all of that to GitHub. After 18 years of SVM, we've just realized Year and year and year, people are simply reinventing what's already been in decade. Uh, so we decided to put it on GitHub, uh, where it is easier to find. So uh, all of the NMR spectroscopy, literally all, if there's something in NMR that it doesn't do, let me know. Uh, likewise for EPR and much of MRI, hyperpolarization. And uh, so uh, our ambition is to eventually have Crota. Uh, for now, we have every thinkable variation of grape. 
in there and all sorts of spin system level exotic mutation. Org, uh, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice talk showing a number of really impressive beards. So maybe we have time for one or two really quick questions because we're a little bit over time. So here, from another beard. Yeah, thank you for this comprehensive and impressive overview. Uh, maybe I can pick up uh, uh, the question uttered by uh, Christiane. So in uh, the years when uh, Tommaso was having this platform of exchange of ideas where Sophie uh, contributed, uh, we, we were uh, questioning ourselves, what is uh, the right way of uh, addressing these types of optimal control problems. Is it really time domain? Is it frequency domain? Or is it somewhere in between, which one could uh, formalize by wavelets? Uh, and I think you have uh, now really the, the competence and experience, and you were not part of uh, uh, this core of uh, brainstorming. Uh, but uh, I remember that you joined when we uh, uh, came to Cambridge uh, together with Frank. Uh, and uh, with all your experience, so what would you say? Uh, are there uh, problem adapted bases? And how would one come by them? It is necessarily absolutely certain time domain uh, and never frequency domain because of time of flight configuration. Right? The length of the wire, I mean, the, the wavefront velocity in Hopper wire is two thirds of the speed of light, right? To fly 20 centimeters, it will take a nanosecond an awfully long time. So different control, controls will arrive at different parts of some quantum with different delay. And delay differential equations. So we have no choice but to run in domain, firstly. And secondly, what is the... Oh, yes. And get distorted. That's right. And these are all time domain processes. And then uh, on the choice of the base set, uh, this is something I picked up at the this year's conference. They they remarked at some point that there's no such thing as complexity, there's such a thing as a bad base. Uh, right. And so in a good basis, degrees of freedom decouple. A good basis is the is the eigen basis of the local, because every mode in which you can move is independent from every other mode. Like how to dynamically achieve achieve that uh, tomato might no uh, I certainly don't but I think physical insight I mean eigenfunctions of some pertinent operator uh, are usually for whatever I'd say yeah I'm probably just uh, which which functions are natural for some in some particular 